This is the first ever, I think, um, session at this um, symposium, 11th year, where we get to have political aspects um, as part of the foreign policy discussion. So I'd like to also touch on the topic of parliamentary diplomacy, because that's a term that comes up often even in the media. And during this session, I'd like to find out from our speakers how they feel the parliaments contribute or shape foreign policy decisions or any sort of formats uh, that they are involved in, if they can name any examples from their uh, foreign travel where they had uh, some successes, what they feel might be limitations overall, um, and whether the multilateral interactions um, are, as we heard in the previous panel, are weakening or there are some hopes for us um, in today's uh, world. Uh, next uh, round of questions will deal with um, also our commemoration of the 30th anniversary of Velvet Revolution. I'd like to know a personalized take on pro possibly where they were, what their thoughts were around the time of 1989, those years, and 30 years on. Um, how they see these 30 years have shaped Czech Republic. But also, I, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, we often hear that we are immature democracies and we need helping hand. Whether they feel that we actually are proactively shaping things or we are still in a position of learning curve. Um, so what's the state of democracy for them? And maybe because we have a lot of young people here, how they see the future for the Czech Republic, where are we going? Because some of the images in media portraying Czech Republic going to the east, towards Russia, China, some are saying we are taking side of the European Union, United States is dominant. So this kind of future projection, and then I'll open the questions to the audience. So who is on the panel today? Next to me is uh, Mr. Jan Hamacek, who is uh, the leader of the Social Democrats, and he's also currently Minister of Interior. He was the Speaker of the Chamber of Deputies of the Parliament of the Czech Republic, and so he's got a wide range of uh, experience. Actually, he also was an acting Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, last year, <laughs> so he, he's sort of at home here as well. Next to him is Mr. Alexander Vondra. Uh, some of you might recognize him as the former Minister of Defense, but he also was ambassador to the United States for Czech Republic. He was the Minister of Foreign Affairs, and he's currently uh, also linked to works as an MP uh, in the European Parliament, and he's representing the Civic Democratic Party. Um, next to him is uh, Mr. Karl Schwarzenberg, who is the um, honorary chairman um, at Top 9 political party. Um, he's got a lengthy uh, experience, um, obviously was running for president, um, and he also was Minister of Foreign Affairs, so has a very strong connection to foreign affairs. Um, next to him, we have Ms. Senator Václav Hampel, uh, who came here as a representative um, from the Christian and Democratic Union and Czechoslovak People's Party. Um, served a long time at university, at Charles University, so he's got a very strong educational background, but currently presides the Senate's Committee on European Union Affairs. Um, missing person who's coming a bit later, oh, he's coming right now, excellent timing, um, Jan Lipavsky, who is from the Czech Pirate Party, and it's a, some of you might have noticed, it's been a party that uh, in the last elections had a very successful entry into the parliament, and he is very knowledgeable on IT technologies, banking politics, interested in international relations and international security. So we've got the whole range. I have to say we have two apologies from, um, from the Communist Party, from Mr. Philip, who had to travel for work to Kazakhstan, and then we also have apology from the current um, 
uh, Chairman of the De Chamber of Deputies, Mr. Vondráček from ANO, who is not feeling well today. So I'll give the floor to Mr. Hamáček to provide his five-minute remarks on the foreign policy priorities for his party. Good morning. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here with you today. And let me, let me tell you a few words on behalf of the Czech uh, Social Democrats on how we see uh, foreign policy and foreign policy priorities of the Czech Republic. Uh, perhaps uh, it's good to start with um, a definition that someone said, uh, what, what the difference is between policy and foreign policy. And uh, the difference is, as I was told, that policy is about survival until next elections and foreign policy is about survival until the next century. So I think that pretty much defines what role does foreign policy play in our national debate. And I have to say that we might differ uh, on issues like healthcare, uh, the welfare system, uh, pensions, and so on and so forth. But generally, over the last 30 years, I think there's been a broad national consensus on the, the main pillars of Czech foreign policy. And that is pretty much, I think, applicable to all uh, speakers present, uh, though the Pirate Party is very new, but still I think they would subscribe to this national consensus. So uh, we were able, as the Czech Republic, to define uh, after the Velvet Revolution what, what we want to do and what we want to achieve. And the main goal uh, was to return to the family of nations that uh, share the, the, the set of values like uh, democracy, human rights, freedom, and that's why we have striven over the last years to uh, join the European Union and, uh, and NATO. And um, I'm proud uh, to be a member of a party that brought this uh, country uh, to uh, those organizations, and uh, uh, I think that never in the history of the Czech Republic has been uh, cared so well for our security and for our well, well-being. Um, where we began to differ a little bit, uh, that came at the, at the moment when we succeeded in, in, in this main aim. We entered the uh, European Union, we entered uh, NATO, and then we started to discuss what to do with it. Uh, what, is the future, what is the future for, for, for Europe? What is the future for the alliance? And then I think uh, you might see some different uh, ideas and different proposals, what direction should these two organizations take. Being a, a social democrat, I believe that uh, the best way for the Czech Republic is to carry on with uh, the, the, this unique project of European <laughs> integration. And um, um, the main reasons for it being that uh, the changes in today's world are so complex and the challenges are so, so enormous that uh, it's impossible for a country of this size uh, to, to tackle all the challenges head on on its own. And, and one single example is the migration crisis that we went through a couple of years ago. And we all learned that uh, it doesn't make any sense to try to resolve this issue on our own. There were some, who, but none of them is present here, who were, who were advocating that we should leave the European Union and, and, and build, build a fence around the Czech Republic and that, that that would be the solution. But obviously this is not the solution. And the only viable option was to join forces and try to, to resolve uh, this crisis together. And uh, though there's, there are still huge challenges ahead of us, I think uh, Europe, Europe uh, has managed. So I, I believe that we should carry on with the project. And although there are some hurdles uh, on, on, on the way, like Brexit, for example, we should uh, carry on. We, we should try to explain and convince the people that it makes sense uh, to work uh, together. And that pretty much applies also not only to the to political dimension of, of uh, this cooperation, but also to uh, the economical uh, dimension. I, I, I personally believe that, that this, this country should, at one stage, join the Eurozone and, uh, and be part of this uh, nucleus of Europe, because the Eurozone is not only a gathering of states that have the same currency, but also it's a political, uh, political entity. And uh, there are serious decisions being made at, the, at this level. And I don't, think, I don't see a reason why the Czech Republic should be, uh, should be left out of it. Um, when it comes to NATO, uh, NATO is going through a difficult period. I think uh, it's not about, only about NATO, but it's all, in a way about redefining uh, our, uh, our relationship with the US. Uh, I, before, before this uh, uh, U.S. administration, 
no one uh, expected that we would be saying things like that um, here today, but uh, the, the changes in, 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 uh, in Washington, um, I think, force us to, 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 to think what is the future of these, this transatlantic link and uh, what is, the, what is the, the future of NATO. And something we used to be uh, taking uh, for granted is now, is now not that granted. So uh, I, I attended uh, the, 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 the last NATO summit in, 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 in Brussels, uh, where there was a row between President Trump and, uh, and the European leaders. And I have to say, this was a sobering uh, moment because um, we have always said that, that while being members of NATO, being covered by the Washington Treaty, um, for our security, we, we, couldn't do, we couldn't do much more. But uh, the fact that the US does have some, uh, that does have different opinions on, on, on various things and that uh, the decision-making process in the US is sort of uh, streamlined in a way that it's being decided by one, one man and uh, some, sometimes difficult for the US uh, the diplomacy to explain what was actually going on. Um, we can call it Twitter diplomacy. This is something we have to cope with and uh, we have to sort of uh, factor it into our decision-making in the future. But Having said that, uh, we, we are st still committed to NATO, we are still committed to uh, uh, the transatlantic link being as strong as, as possible because we simply have no other alternative. I obviously welcome regional cooperation, uh, although uh, the, the, the Visegrad group does have some, some issues and problems, but nevertheless we were able <coughs> to uh, form a, a uh, group of four Central European countries that, that are able to talk to each other and, and are able to find um, uh, common positions on some of the crucial uh, issues that we are facing. And the big challenge, and th that's something where we might also uh, differ, is how we, how we treat the, I would say, the new powers, the growing powers like, the, uh, like China or, uh, all, or, or Russia. There are some who advocate for uh, the more strong, uh, strong uh, um, hand, handling of of, uh, of, of those. Um, I understand that uh, it's it's a complex issue. China is, is growing rapidly, and it's overtaking uh, countries that, that used to be economically much much bigger, and much and much much more powerful than them. But that's a reality, and we have to we, we have to face it. Russia is, got, is, is gaining, uh, uh, gaining uh, its, its uh, footing on the international scene. So this is something we have to, we have to work with and, um, and uh, we have to find a way how we keep our values, but at the same time how we can get things done. And I'm, I believe that without uh, effective uh, multilateral cooperation without, without uh, frank and open exchange of uh, views and ideas, we, are, we, we will not be able to resolve the, the challenges that are ahead of us, be it the climate change, be it, um, be it globalization. So um, I think that's enough to kick off and I'll be more than happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Please, Mr. Vondra. So, good morning. It seems to me that the Czech Republic does not need the foreign policy anymore. <laughs> so I'm hesitant about, uh, you know, I remember the crowds full in this great hall, you know, when we were discussing foreign policy 10, 20, 30 years ago. Now it's empty almost. So thanks for those who did not give up that. Uh, second, the major political party is not here. You know, I was not feeling well at two, 2 in the morning. I was getting up in Little Mjeritze, packing my luggage to fly to Brussels today. But I came, even when I was sending my wrong, my angry messages to Irka Kozak, whom I promised to be here. <laughs> because I'm the old school, so even if I don't, don't feel well, I'm here. Because I committed to come. So that's where we are. And uh, I guess that we need a foreign policy. Uh, maybe more than, and we will need it in the future more than any time before, at least in the last 10 years. So this relaxed uh, environment maybe is caused that uh, we had a nice skiing, you know, on the slow slope 
in the last two decades. We have everything achieved in around 97, 2000. And I, I am the one who had the privilege to write the, the first uh, foreign policy or foreign policy program or concept uh, for the newly independent Czech Republic. So it was the late 1992, early 1993, here in the building. And uh, that time I, uh, I said that, you know, we need three things regarding the vectors of our foreign policy work and three issues uh, regarding the thematic uh, orientation of our uh, state agenda in abroad. Regarding uh, the vectors, I said that, you know, if uh, we are looking for a stable environment, if we want, you know, to have a quality lunch or dinner in the evening, uh, we have to work hard to stabilize our relationship in three directions. Uh, table, you know, if he has just two legs, it's not stable. So the minimum is three to reach a stability of the table. Uh, one was, uh, uh, and all the legs must be of the same length to have a stable table. So one leg, uh, uh, Europe, second leg, Atlantic, and the third leg in the neighborhood. So that uh, led us to uh, pursue uh, the membership in the EU. It led us to pursue the membership in NATO, and it led us uh, to do the thing, two things uh, regionally, uh, to have a common understanding with Germany as the largest uh, neighbor with, which, with which we are broadly economically interconnected, and secondly, uh, Visegrad cooperation, which was also established uh, early in the 90s. And regarding those three pillars or legs, I think, you know, I have nothing to change. My party is still behind all those key priorities. Uh, the problem is that seeing in, you know, projecting this into the future, all three legs are under the pressure. And if our agenda uh, three, 30 years ago was to pursue the road, to achieve something, so it was an offensive uh, agenda, now it's more or less the defensive. So to protect those legs, to do uh, our best to save them before committing the suicide. Uh, EU is under the pressure from within, uh, mostly. Uh, marked with three uh, serious fault lines, one dividing north and south. It's the Eurozone problem and uh, the lack of the convergence. Uh, second is uh, the fault line dividing west and the east, which was typically uh, uh, merging under the surveys with the migration crisis. And the third is uh, the Brexit. We have adopted the Lisbon Treaty to make uh, EU a global powerhouse, and the result is that we are smaller, weaker. Uh, so to protect the EU before committing the suicide should be the first priority, to keep it. Second, NATO. It's under the attack uh, for, because of the lack of the transatlantic bargain. The Americans were pardoning us that we did not pay enough for 20, 30 years. Uh, our soldiers were doing our best work to sacrifice their life, uh, to raise the flag in the various foreign missions. But now we are back to the core of the NATO agenda, which is Article 5. And here we have to pay more. Otherwise, NATO could be killed by the lack of the interest on the US side. And it's, 
an uneasy topic. It's an uneasy task. Uh, you know, now everybody is heading into this green revolution, which would be extremely costly. And, you know, to find the resources in Germany, in Spain, in Italy, in the Czech Republic to double the uh, expenses for defense, it's really a huge challenge. So to protect NATO is a must, because without NATO, Europe, without the UK, it's nothing. Without the nuclear weapons, the French arsenal, with all the respect, is a joke. So, and then the third regional one, uh, we, the both entities are under the pressure too. Visegrad is under the pressure because, you know, I, I, I hear, maybe you discussed this yesterday, I don't know, but uh, some good men are coming, you know, intoxicated in Berlin or Paris that, you know, Visegrad group is a toxic and we should leave that? No. If you are doing, I established Visegrad and if you will do it, I will, I will show you my personal muscles. Because that's, that's makes committed suicide, to bring us back to the First Republic. And the same is with Germany. Uh, yes, we have the excellent relationship, but, you know, what is going to be Germany in the next 10 years, once they would wake up from this situation, you know, once the burden of this global warming agenda would be burned by them, uh, well, I am afraid. Uh, just read the elections. It starts in the east, but it could easily jump into the west. Uh, so, to protect those legs and to protect the balance among those three legs, because otherwise the table would be destroyed and we will not have this quiet quality dinner anymore. Three pillars uh, regarding the teams, economy, business. We are export-oriented country, this same like Germany, so we need to protect the open uh, access to the external market both within Europe as well as outside Europe. And again, you know, we have 30 years of the liberalization of the world trade behind ourselves, and we have an era of protectionism ahead of us. Uh, we do not know, you know, whether we would keep our uh, open access to the UK market after the Brexit. And now EU is starting to, uh, to, to change its uh, policy of the free trade too with conditioning the various agreements like with Mercosur, with Asian countries, with the climate policy. So, you know, I can easily imagine a trade wars not just between US and China, but also between Europe and Indonesia, between Europe and Brazil, between Europe and India, and at the end also between Europe and US and China too. So it's something that would harm our well-being here more than any other country in Europe. So again, it's, uh, it's a defensive uh, uh, task ahead of ourselves. Second, was, uh, second thematic priority was the human rights, yes. That was a legacy which we brought from our freedom fighting uh, tradition that, you know, they were helping us in 1980s, so we should do the same, and we did it over the next two decades after the Velvet Revolution. Due to the effort of the Czech diplomacy, there were two freedom fighters in the world who got uh, the, the Nobel Peace Award. Havel was an emblem here. But now we do have a problem. We do not have anybody in uh, the state command who would be able to promote that. But we have also the problem elsewhere that, you know, 20, 30 years ago, the human, right, human rights agenda was simple. It was the elementary freedoms, human rights. Now Europe has extended this 
to the social rights, culture rights, to the second third generation, and it does not work globally. It doesn't work in Asia. So we are losing to play the role of the beacon for the others. So, you know, we do not have anybody who would bear the flame here, and we have nobody to listen to us seriously outside. So the third agenda of the team was to raise the visibility of the Czech Republic. It was very important, you know, image building for the new state of the international scene. Now we are here 30 years, they know what we are able to do, what we are mighty to do, and what we are not able to do. So perhaps it's not as such important as, as it was, but the business, uh, uh, it's a real important because it's about our wealth, about our living conditions. So three legs plus promoting the open access to, uh, to the outside markets I would say those stays as the priority for my party, and I strongly believe it should stay as the priority for the country as a whole. Thank you very much for the remarks. Uh, can I please ask Mr. Schwarzenberg for his remarks? Well, <coughs> first of all, I would like to tell you what my party is. We are a Liberal Conservative Party, which expressively declares in its founding uh, document that we base on the Judeo-Christian uh, heritage. So that's the point of, of where we start out of all politics. If we speak about foreign policy, I can't help it. But the most omitted it, but in my view still, the most important part of our foreign policy is the European policy, and where we should be more involved. We are, between the Czech political parties, the political party which is pro-European. We are not pro-skeptics, we are really profoundly pro-European party, which is rather rare epic think between your political parties. So we differ in some views. Uh, for instance, uh, we would advise our country to accept uh, now when we are economically strong the euro. I know it's not popular in the country because people were shocked of the development in Greece and Portugal and so on, and maybe in Italy too. Nevertheless, I do think we should now really uh, get it out of the more <coughs> emotional discussion uh, and look what's the advantages and disadvantages. And it seems to be that uh, the acceptance of Europe would be really advantage for uh, the Czech economy. Uh, at least most industries would prefer it. Uh, the, we would, in Europe in defense, we uh, would prefer that we uh, <coughs> preserving the NATO, which is elementary for the security for the whole continent, naturally for our country too. Without NATO, the Europe would be immediately torn into part. But we have to preserve NATO, but we have to build as soon as possible independent European forces too, because we have to accept, and the experience of the last year shows it, that the two very important partners in the NATO alliance, the United States and Turkey, which have politics which are sometimes very in going in different directions than European interests. As the American policy, in the last year, but for a long time we already see the Turkish uh, has its own interests in Middle East, in Africa and so on, and we have uh, to have the chance of the European states uh, to intervene in our neighbourship, even if the United States and Turkey would not be 
willing to do it and would better it in the NATO alliance. Um, we do think that um, in will be is the same thing as Dr. Vondra said, we would uh, like to preserve the uh, Visegrad uh, group. But of course, we have uh, in the different, in the Visegrad group, a different views too. And I do think that the Czech Republic should be more clear in their view with, uh, considering democracy, rule of law, and so on. And I don't think that it's the job of the Czech diplomacy uh, to keep the Hungarian line in foreign, po in Europe, foreign and especially European policy. Uh, and Mr. Orban Viktor has his own views on democracy in his own country. As you know, he declares he would like to have a liberal democracy, and he has his own view in European policy. And I think the Czech Republic, by preserving the Visegrad group, should be the clear democratic opposition to this policy. We should have our own view in the Visegrad group too. We should, I think, in, I don't see it's more difficult than in the times when I was active in human rights, that's doubtless. Still, I don't think it has lost its sense today. We have, that's a, a bit unhappy development, that to the cause of human rights were added a lot of other rights which I don't think so elementary for the liberty of, of humanity. But the classical human rights, is, is are still worth to be defended, and it's still worth that it should be a topic of the Czech foreign policy. I think when we gave up, we gave up one very important thing, because its foreign policy is, has its market as everything in the world, and of course, <coughs> a small country has, has a small industry, a small factory, find its niche in foreign policy. And the niche of uh, Czech foreign policy was human rights, as for instance, for Switzerland, is that in Switzerland, hotels throughout the country, there can be very secret conferences, meeting the most different partners, and nobody speaks about it, and the Swiss keep it secret. The Norwegians engage in all kinds of uh, conflicts as mediators <coughs> are very active in that. And we were active in human rights when we gave it up. I think we gave up a very useful niche where one, the Czech foreign policy could, could be clear and recognizable in the whole world, and we had a certain reputation. Uh, I hope the present minister comes now back that the, foreign, that the human rights correctly understood are still worth to be defended and it's in, in a lot of countries it's really very important. I do think we should have a definite pro-European policy that the Czech Republic should play the role in what the English call Mary Mary or country be beginning from the migrants to other questions that we should be very much active in promoting uh, the European reform, the reforms of the European Union, and much active in the European policy. Uh, by neglecting it, we um, diminished our influence too. If I look uh, on countries of comparable size, or even lesser, in the European Union, like, for instance, Belgium or Luxembourg, and see their influence and their possibilities in the European, and compare it with our possibilities and what we achieved, we do see that the purely negative policy uh, was not really very effective. And I think we should be an active European country, of course, 
it's clear to us that the European Union, as every institution in the world, needs reforms. And of course, uh, living in this uh, Central Europe, I know its history, I remember one entity, I don't remember it, but I know one entity which existed here, which was a multinational, that was the old Austrian Empire. Since the 1880s, this old Austrian Empire wasn't able of reforms. And that was the real cause for its own. Not the World War I, not policy of the Great Powers, but in the moment when this empire was not able of reforms, it was clear that it will end very soon. And it's for me in the paramount importance that the European Union uh, is able to reform itself. I think it was the greatest thing which in Europe happened during the last thousand years. We shouldn't forget that the Union of Europe is an astonishing success because the unions which were created before, be it Germany, Italy, needed minimum three wars. Even the really uh, American Union of the United States needed several wars and an awful civil war that the present United States developed. We achieved whatever without a single drop of blood. The European Union developed during 60 years relatively successful politically and especially economically without a war. Maybe that's the reason why we have not still the emotional uh, identification with the European Union. Maybe it's true because, if, for instance, the Ger Germans started to identify themselves as German and not as Bavarians or Prussians or whatever after the big war with the French and the declare of the German Reich in Versailles when they first time won a great war against France. May I hope we don't need, no need this uh, dramatic movement. Maybe we don't need that we have <coughs> again such a danger as our fathers and grandfathers had. Because the, let's be honest, in front of the European Parliament in Strasbourg, there should be a monument for the two men who really made it possible that the European Union developed. Their name was Adolf Hitler and Josip Vissarionovich Dugashvili, called public mostly Stalin. If there wasn't Hitler and wasn't Stalin, the European nations would have been never able to create the European Union. Now, as they fade in history, and it's eight, 70 years when, the last, when Stalin died and Hitler died eight years before, eight years before, we don't see the necessity and the urgency of the European Union. I hope, I hope really, that we don't need again such a uh, shock as we had during World War II and uh, the Stalinist conquest of all of Eastern Europe that we create, that we stick together. Maybe we can reach it in still in a peaceful way, but we should work more intensively on it. But being an old man now and being in different forms of European policy in several decades, it's of course true that the generation whom I knew very well, which was still in the world of the second or lived the difficult years of the 40s and 50s in European policy. They were much more emotionally engaged Europeans than the present generation who sees it purely from the economic view. And we should forget that the European Union, as it was written by Jean Monnet and then realized by great people like Adenauer, de Gasperi, Schumann, etc., wasn't a uh, uh, project. It was always a political project. 
at, oh, when in the last years they were stressing always the economic side. I remember for, time, for some time when Mrs. Merkel identified the European Union with the existence uh, of the euro. Now, we should go back to its roots. It's a political project and we should support that. If you, that I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I will have to uh, move yes. on because we yes. have... Uh, I'm, I'm ending, all right. Thank you so much. But maybe it, that was just to explain on which basis, on which ideas the foreign policy of top zero nine exists. Thank you very much. Much. Uh, now I would like to ask Senator Hampel, because he is actually uh, in charge of leading the group at the Senate for European Affairs, so this really nicely links to probably your expertise. Uh, thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I should start with a short disclaimer. I'm probably the only panelist here who is not a member of any political party, but I am a proud member of the faction of Christian Democrats in the Senate, so I try to speak for Christian Democrats, but I, I cannot guarantee that 100% of, of, of I say will always be perfectly aligned with official positions of Christian Democratic Party here. Uh, Anyway, I, I think it, it was said at the beginning of this panel that uh, even though the political parties you know, struggle, disagree on many, many issues in, in foreign policies uh, or foreign policy, there is a lot, uh, a lot of mutual agreement and lot of, lots of mutual uh, understanding. And I think the, the panel here uh, illustrates it, uh, it uh, quite well. Uh, I'm afraid I, I am not going to say anything very seriously different from what my uh, colleagues have said uh, so far. This is, this is, I think, very well uh, illustrated by the example of the current uh, Czech uh, foreign minister, Mr. Petříček, who is a prominent member of uh, Social Democrats, yet all of his uh, foreign uh, steps in foreign politics, I, as almost a Christian Democrat, perfectly support. I, I, I think he, he's doing really, really uh, good job in, in foreign policy in the view of my values, um, uh, my political views. Uh, Christian uh, Democratic Union, as, as the party is called, uh, uh, intentionally models itself after the example of uh, especially German Christian Democratic Party. Uh, so many of its positions uh, of, of Czech Christian uh, Democrats are very similar to, to uh, German Christian Democrats, and that's true also for, uh, for foreign policy. So it comes as no surprise that things such as a strong role of EU in, in the foreign policy is natural. A very strong uh, position of NATO uh, in our international position is, is very natural. Uh, I would say Czech Christian Democrats are also promoting better role or, or more active role of Czech Republic in the EU, but so far we are not very successful in this. Uh, as, as was mentioned here, the, the, uh, so far the, the uh, situation of Czech Republic in the uh, EU is, is either passive or let's say rather blocking some uh, some common initiatives we are very well aware that reforms are necessary uh, but we are not very good in coming up with proposals how, how the reforms should uh, should should look like uh, this is especially important in uh, in the context of one topic that if i listen carefully wasn't mentioned uh, or hasn't been mentioned so far here today and that's the proposals or perspectives for enlargement of, uh, of EU, uh, especially looking at the Western Balkan countries. Uh, that's something uh, that is very much supported by, by, let's say, Czech diplomacy, but also by Czech parliament, all Czech governments in recent decades, I would say. Uh, it's another example of uh, the fact that regardless of which political party is currently in power, this issue has a broad, a broad support. But at the same time, we should understand uh, 
the concerns of some uh, some EU member countries that uh, such a, uh, that further enlargement of EU would pose even more difficulties for governing such a uh, uh, such a large body such as the enlarged EU. So internal reforms, especially of how the EU is steered, how it's governed, how the decisions are uh, made. Uh, is, is probably necessary and I think uh, uh, if we mean our support for uh, EU enlargement seriously then we really should think hard about possible reforms in EU in terms of, uh, of governance. Uh, another important issue currently very important in my view uh, re related to EU is, is the euro, the common, uh, common European currency, as was mentioned here, not very popular among the citizens, I think partly because of the problems, especially in Greece, partly because of a very active role of some politicians, uh, sort of deterring uh, euro. Uh, but it's pretty clear that if something serious is, or, or, or uh, let's say, Oh, serious is a good word. Something serious is uh, going to happen in EU, some movement forward within the EU, then it's going to be around the, the euro, around the countries playing with euro, around uh, the mechanisms governing the eurozone. So staying out of that, uh, out of that group, uh, I, I firmly believe is not uh, in the interest of uh, our country. Uh, V4, another important thing, uh, aspect, it was mentioned here today, uh, our position is yes, it is very important uh, for the Czech Republic to have good relations with its immediate neighbors. And that's the role that V4 plays. Uh, that's a positive thing. At the same time, especially in the recent years, it's clear that V4 uh, maneuvered itself into a position which is not always uh, uh, very good for, for, for ourselves. So I think we should uh, really work uh, hard within V4 to, to promote our values, uh, to make sure that our values uh, sort of are visible within uh, V4 and at the same time uh, be clear where we do, do, not, uh, do not have uh, common positions. Uh, I have a few notes on Russia and China, but maybe I'll skip those for now. Maybe we will get to them uh, uh, in the following discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Good to know we have some interesting topics coming up, uh, as you suggested. And uh, now, please, Mr. Lipovsky from the Pirate Party. Thank, thank you very much. I'm, I'm a little bit cold, so sorry, sorry for my voice. It's not so so clear. So, so let me start with a little bit about Pirate Party because I think um, it's necessary to explain what we are, what we come from, so, so you could understand uh, how we create our policies and how we see the, the, the policies, uh, the Czech, Czech foreign policy. So Pirate Party in Czech Republic, it's 10 year old party. party. Uh, it's older than Mr. Schwarzenberg, Schwarzenberg party, it's older than ANO, the, 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 the biggest party nowadays. It, it's older <laughs> than uh, Tomi Okamura's parties, for example. Uh, to be short, the, the very root of our thinking is uh, human freedom, human liberties. That's, that's the very bottom of all our policies we think about. So. Uh, I think that uh, that explains uh, how we think. The party started, of course, as a single issue party uh, regarding the issue of uh, freedom on internet. But in Czech Republic, but also in other countries like um, Iceland or Luxembourg, the parties which are successful were able to make a step from the single issue party to the full spectrum party. and. Uh, then, uh, then you know, being being elected, getting MPs and, and et cetera. So you may you may think that the human freedoms, liberties are, are some kind of ideals, and therefore our policies are idealistic. I would I would agree with that. But 
do not uh, interchange between the ideals and naivety. We are not naive, we are understand the world we are living and uh, we are also, uh, of course trying to find the pragmatic solution to, to things we are trying to push. So, that was on the, on the Pirate Party in Czech Republic. Uh, what are our priorities in the Czech foreign policy? Uh, I think I can agree with many things that has been said uh, by my uh, predecessors. Uh, basically, we agree with the, with, the, with the basic agreement on a Czech political level excluding Communist Party and right-wing right -wing extremists. Uh, what uh, uh, that means that the European Union is an important part of our policy, uh, uh, the, the NATO is important for our um, uh, security, for the hard security. Uh, so I, I think there is no like, uh, so then we are talking about the uh, differences, uh, about, uh, about some on, on a smaller level. So I would begin with the, with the most important thing that is for our party, it's uh, the orientation toward Europe. Toward Europe. Uh, we see it as a future. Uh, and if I speak about Europe, it doesn't mean only European Union, because you have many other institutions which creates the, 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 the European framework, the, the environment uh, we live in. It's OEC, OECD, which is not European organization, but basically most, uh, many countries are from Europe. It's uh, based in Paris. It's OECE, uh, which oversees on the quality of the elections and uh, democratic processes. It's a Council of Europe, uh, which oversees uh, the human rights, basically. Uh, then you have many regional platforms, uh, including V4. The, the V4 itself is not toxic. The toxic in V4, it's the policies of Viktor Orban or, uh, or Kaczynski. So that's something we should be working with and trying to influence, not just blindly follow it or just being drugged by, by the de development. So, so the basic idea is to be present and uh, in all those platforms, in all those institutions, uh, promote Czech, Czech interests. Uh, I think it's necessary to say that Europe is a new category. Mr. Mr. Vondra has a very good remark regarding where is the foreign policy, of course. You cannot judge the state of the foreign policy by one conference. On the other side, it's good observation that, uh, Czech, for, for example, Czech foreign ministry has lost some of its competencies. With the entering to NATO, big part of the defense planning was moved to the Army, Ministry of Defense. With the entering to European Union, a big portion of the policy was moved to uh, premiership, to, uh, to, to, um, uh, to, to office of the Prime Minister, because he is now directing all the uh, horizontal, uh, vertical policies in, in EU, agriculture, and et cetera. So the, the, the foreign policy uh, matters has shrinked. But, but, but Europe is a new, new category for itself. It's not a domestic policy. It's not a foreign policy as such. So uh, I think this is something uh, we have to uh, be working with. We have to learn how to work with that. Um, and uh, it's, I think it's a big challenge. Uh, I would also like to mention that from the perspective of the Pirate Party, you know, the neutrality, neutrality, it's illusion. Uh, you cannot, neutrality in the current world means that someone else will try to take, take uh, over or um, put their influence here, uh, here in this territory in Czech, in Czechia. Yeah. So we should be clear in our orientation toward Europe, European Union, and uh, NATO. Uh, it was also mentioned that the economy will be always in the Czech condition, uh, export oriented. I think it's a good thing. Um, I don't consider personally the trade with the EU countries as a, as a foreign trade as such, even though it's not a domestic trade as such, it's a category for itself. Uh, and that, what we should be, what, what, that, that is what we should be doing in the EU to promote Czech interests for the Czech, um, uh, Czech companies and uh, being present there as much as possible. Uh, there's also 
there's all the time the vision of diversification, diversification, that we should trade more with Russia, China, or other countries, but the Europe will be all the always, all the time on the first place. And our economy should be therefore based on the know-how, because pure production, mass production, uh, may satisfy those less developed markets, but the most developed markets, Germany, France, US, and rest of the Europe will always need the know-how oriented, know oriented thing. Uh, I will just quickly wrap it up. Um, for Czech Republic, for Czechia, it's necessary to have a strong multilateral order because in the global scale, we are a small country. In the European scale, we are like middle-sized country. And that kind of order gives us possibility to influence things. If the world ends up in some multipole, I don't know, China, USA world, then uh, we are losing. Uh, also with uh, the, the barriers, the barriers and stuff like that. So, I think I've mentioned all necessary uh, things regarding our view on foreign policy, and I'm ready to take some questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for remarks. Um, I think we've learned about some major priorities, and I could sense a few uh, nuances. Uh, there are some differences in uh, rhetoric. I will open the floor, because that's the main, I guess, idea here to have interaction with the audience before I would ask any of my questions. So is there anyone, and we can collect a few questions uh, I see over there, if you can introduce yourselves please and what organization you are representing. I will collect a few questions and then we'll ask our panelists to reply. Uh, hello, my name is Vít Beneš, I'm from the Metropolitan University here in Prague. Um, it's very nice to hear you speaking uh, about co broad consensus uh, in the Czech Republic regarding foreign policy. And it was obvious from your presentation that you agree on most things. But it seems to me that you not only agree on things that should be said, but you seem to agree on things that you uh, do not say or that you forgot to say. I have listened carefully. And actually none of you uh, mentioned the United Nations. Uh, you have speak, uh, spoken about many uh, regional organizations uh, declining or uh, organizations which are being threatened. Uh, you talked about the EU, NATO, you have even mentioned OECD, uh, you have mentioned uh, uh, the Council of Europe, but none of you mentioned Europe, which is puzzling because uh, this kind of multilateralism, and it's in the title of this panel, has been the core uh, of uh, the foreign policy of Czechoslovakia. I'm referring back to uh, the First Republic and the support for the League of Nations. It has been the core of, um, of our foreign policy, and it has featured quite prominently in many uh, conceptions of uh, Czechoslovak and Czech foreign policy. Uh, so it's kind of puzzling that uh, uh, the United Nations has been completely uh, absent from your presentations. You know, I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, an advocate of the United Nations. Uh, I see me just, just, uh, just puzzling and funny. I don't know why. Maybe because we take um, the existence of UN and other multilateral institutions like WTO or IMF uh, for granted. Uh, or did you forget to mention the United Nations because it's simply behind your horizons uh, and you do not, you simply forget about, uh, about uh, global issues and uh, rather focus on you know, small issues like European integration or transatlantic bonds, which is a particular issue. Uh, so that's, that, that's my comment, my question. What, do you think about, about, about multilateralism, about the United Nations and other multilateral uh, organizations? Thank you. Thank you, Vid. I will collect more questions, but maybe I should take the blame and the bullet right now because I did not include UN in my request uh, as uh, addressing UN 
uh, in their remarks, so I gladly take the bullet right now, but it will be nice to get those answers uh, anyway uh, in the follow-up remarks. So it's not, uh, you know, it, maybe that's why it's uh, so left out from the topic, but there could be also truth to yours that it, people take it for granted. So partially I am responsible <laughs> for that. But um, I'll collect more questions and yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, I'm Tomasz Kom. I'm from People in Need, which is Czech Development Aid Organization as well, Human Rights Organization. Uh, I would like to ask, because uh, we are talking here a lot about the powers and the superpowers, about the EU, about, about China, about Russia, but I would like to ask about the developing, developing countries, what uh, the panelists think should be the Czech approach towards the uh, developing countries in Africa or in Asia or elsewhere, and maybe one connected question, because uh, I think in this co at this conference we are talking a lot about uh, pragmatism or something which I would, or maybe the international relations uh, students will call like realism, and uh, so we get we have this pragmatism in the international relations now, and at the same time we have the global issues which sometimes are popping up at this conference as well as could be the climate change, sometimes migration is labeled as such, sometimes uh, the human rights were mentioned, and I would mention as well the extreme poverty. And I would like to ask if uh, in the current state uh, the panelists see some space for countries su such as Czech Republic to put these uh, one or some of these issues in forefront of its foreign policy as we did in the past with human rights, for example, if they, see, if they could see any added value for Czech Republic in picking up one of these issues in the forefront of our foreign policy. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Teresa Novotna. Uh, I'm academic based at uh, Free University of Berlin, but I also collaborate with Europom here in Prague. Um, you all have been talking a lot about the European Union. Uh, obviously, the EU is undergoing a transition period from what uh, Jean-Claude Juncker called a last chance commission to what the president-elect von der Leyen calls a geopolitical commission. Um, and if things go According to the plan, um, Josep Borrell, if he goes through the hearings in the European Parliament, he, su he should become the next high representative for the uh, foreign affairs. So my question is, what would you like the new upcoming uh, commission to achieve within foreign policy at the global level within the next five years? And what would you like, or how the Czech Republic should uh, push for its priorities? What would you like that uh, Josep Borrell does uh, at the world stage from our perspective. Thank you. Okay, to my right, is there anyone in this group at all? Yes, one last question, yeah. Uh, hello, my name is Odysseus Gramatikaikis, assistant researcher in the Institute of International Relations. Uh, my question is like uh, 30 years have from the Velvet Revolution, and um, I heard some opinions about your rela Czech Republic relationship with Viktor Orban and Hungary. And um, European leaders are calling the, the, the Visegrad group toxic. Um, I want to know like, how Czech Republic, after 30 years of a revolution like, that supported democracy and human rights, um, how you can handle Viktor Orban and also Poland that are going through an, um, a difficult period that some also say it's autocratic. That's my question. Well, we've got some provocative questions here. I will start from my left and then just please everyone uh, who feels uh, they would like to address any questions. Um, that would be great. Well, I'll, <clears throat> I'll try to be telegraphic. Concerning the United Nations, uh, yeah, I, I think it was a mistake not to mention it, but uh, Frankly speaking, um, I think that uh, the reasons for it, at least in, from my point of view, we just accept the UN as it is, and we don't have uh, high expectations from it. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a good platform for discussion, but uh, when it comes to some 
solutions or resolutions, uh, it's 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 basically it's impossible to to achieve anything because the, it's, it's it's the way it's set up. It's it's a, it's basically an institution from uh, the last century that was designed for a, for a world that that is no longer here. And uh, unless we are able to achieve some substantial reform of the UN and especially of the Security Council, we can't uh, expect much. And you can you, if you, if you take any uh, issue being dealt with at the UN level, be it Syria, be it the Middle East, you see that, uh, that it's basically impossible to resolve it because uh, the, the, there are so contradicting interests within the Security Council that, that should, should, uh, it, should someone try to, to come up with a solution, it inevitably crashes. So um, UN is, it, it, it's good to have it, but uh, unless we are able to reform it, it's, uh, I, w I wouldn't say that, that we, we would have uh, high expectations. Uh, concerning um, uh, development aid, yeah, I think uh, we need to, uh, to push forward. Um, I think we should be giving, giving more, but uh, in that uh, we don't have a consensus within, within the government because our coalition partner thinks that we are giving enough. Um, we would, uh, I would rather prefer to focus on, on individual uh, priority countries as we do it at the moment and, uh, and uh, focus on that and um, I would limit our uh, our uh, resources that go into into budget uh, budget assistance i think that's that's uh, not uh, as good as, as direct involvement in in, the, in those countries and you're asking about one topic we should pick up i think the czech republic should finally fo formulate its position towards the the, the climate change and uh, we should be more uh, open and more uh, transparent how we want to tackle the, the, this issue because it is, I think, uh, one, of the, one of the most pressing issues. And if you ask, uh, I've seen a survey, if you ask especially young people what is the most pressing issue uh, that the world is facing today, um, most of them, at least in Central and, and Western Europe, would, would, say, would say climate change. Uh, what do I expect from, uh, from Mr. Borrell? Not much. Uh, uh, I think uh, Federica Mogherini uh, has been struggling for, for, for years. Uh, how to square the circle and how to uh, promote European uh, foreign policy on top of individual national policies. And uh, she was doing her best, but uh, still uh, didn't succeed fully. And uh, I don't think that Mr. Borrell would, would uh, be able to, to, to be any, any better. But the fundamental problem is that although we have a, a, a person, we have that phone number, um, in Brussels, uh, we still have national national foreign policies, and especially when it comes to those hot, uh, those uh, trouble spots uh, that do have some historical links to, uh, so I would say, European powers such as Syria. You'll see that that uh, you might have a European uh, view how to resolve it, but that's certainly a British view and a French view. So unless this is this is this is some, somewhat squared, uh, I don't have uh, any any high expectations. And concerning Orban, um, I mean, I don't, I don't. Well, someone say that the V4 is toxic. Well, it wasn't toxic when when uh, when. Uh, uh, some European politicians needed the votes uh, in order to make this this uh, deal that was that was finally agreed, and, and I think Viktor Orbán's votes were absolutely crucial in order to make the deal. So uh, I don't think that uh, calling someone toxic and then being, being happy with with the votes I need for my project is is fair. Uh, I don't agree with Orbán. Uh, he's he, I'm a central left politician. He's 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 more to the right, and I do have some uh, I, do, I, I do criticize criticize some of his policies, and I do criticize some of the policies of Poland. But um, uh, I think what Europe should do is, is to talk to them. And, uh, and it's in a way good that uh, uh, this, this agenda finally fell on, on Vera Jourova and uh, this, this sort of uh, argument that uh, Hungary and, and Poland is being bullied by, by big uh, Western countries will no longer be uh, relevant because it's, be a Czech, it's going to be a Czech commissioner. Uh, who will who will uh, who will deal with uh, with those issues? So um, I think uh, we don't have to agree with what Orban is doing, but I, I think we should we should talk to him and uh, uh, rather than, than than isolate him. Thank you, Mr. Vondra. Please. Well, on the UN, I was I I, I was planning to speak about the UN here because the title of our. Uh, for originally, the title was Multilateralism as Viewed by Politicians, but 
you have changed that and ask us to tell you about the priorities of our parties. And I think it perfect. Then I did not have a reason to, to, to speak about, about the UN. Because with all the respect, certainly, you know, we are a medium-sized state by European standards, we are a small-sized state by the global standards, so then we need a multilateralism without any doubts. Uh, that's a logic uh, from the textbooks. Uh, uh, but uh, certainly, you know, we have to be realistic in our expectation. And UN did not help us in 1948, UN did not help us in, in 1968, UN did not help us in the uh, early 90s. And, you know, once our existence would be under the threat again, I am, uh, I am skeptical about uh, the ability to, uh, of the, the UN Security Council to act. Uh, you, know, you know, we can see this decision making uh, every year. And in fulfillment of our main goals, like, you know, human rights, you know, the Commission for Human Rights in the UN is a joke, you know, it's occupied by the dictators, and you cannot uh, have a single logic move. WTO is a very important organization, but it's uh, on hold uh, for 15 years, maybe they did not achieve anything uh, with regards to the liberalization of the trade. So, you know, Yes, UN is uh, important. Uh, we will stay certainly uh, within. Uh, I have nothing against the attempts to find a common uh, agreement uh, by, uh, for example, on, on, on our policy towards the climate change. Here it's, uh, I would say, important because I think Europe should not act alone because it would be costly exercise without any effect on the global climate uh, at all. But, uh, you know, what we are going to do if uh, China, if India, if the United States, if Russia, if Brazil, if Indonesia are not going to act. So we are going to declare them the war. Or, so uh, I'm a realistic in, 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 in this. And even the multilateralism, you know, the advantage for the medium size or small state, it's that it uh, saves you the cost and it brings you more legitimacy. Those are the two advantages. But uh, not always all those, those two advantages uh, are, uh, are, are fulfilled. You know, you can uh, uh, find many examples, even maybe with the current debate that would generate so many costs that, you know, to act unilaterally is maybe a cheaper. And uh, with regards to, uh, to uh, legitimacy from within, you know, uh, yes, I'm in favor of multilateralism, but I'm not, and my party is not so much in favor of the, uh, the globalism. And don't mix those two issues, because this globalism, the visions of the planetary civilization, I think, you know, under the current stage of the world development is a prescription just to the health, so we can lose democracy as a, as a, as a, as a fact. And mm -hmm. I don't want to lose democracy and freedom. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, that's to, to the UN, uh, to development assistance as the people in need. That's, I would, I forgot that. I think to cut this image building from these original three thematic priorities and would substitute this with uh, more active uh, development aid. I would absolutely be in favor of that. Uh, the, the commission declaration uh, that is going to be geopolitical, I did not understand that. I don't know. <laughs> Simply, I was just reading that. Uh, no, this is just, if you read the program of uh, von der Leyen, it's Green Deal, Green Deal, Green Deal. So. It's not about the geopolitics at all. It's, uh, it's about uh, the green policy. Uh, so that's what I expect. The main battleground is a green deal. They want to, uh, to achieve the, uh, a, a, a roof or umbrella law uh, promising uh, or enforcing, in fact, not promising, enforcing the the, uh, the, 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 the CO2 neutrality in 2050, and if they are successful, and I think that we cannot agree with that without having an idea how uh, we would pay for this. Uh, you know, if you construct a house, you must know how 
to, to generate the money, otherwise, you know, it's going to the bankruptcy. So, <coughs> then is the sequence of uh, many other events just emerging out of this uh, priority. So, this is Timmermans is, is the head of, of that. So, he was kicked off the, from window and come back through the doors, so or I don't know whether this is the English. Uh, Borel, I don't expect any, uh, <laughs> even less than Onza. Uh, I know, uh, 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 don't expect so much. And geopolitically, no, no, no. So, last but not least, two, 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 two things, Orban. I, uh, I disagree. I am, you know, the Czech conservatism is different from the Hungarian or Polish. The Czech one is more liberal, more urban, uh, but they are conservative. They are not dictators, and I'm going to protect them, to defend them, because this is a bias by the leftist, uh, uh, leftist discourse in, in, in Europe. I don't believe that Margaret Thatcher, I don't believe that Ronald Reagan would uh, criticize them. No, their policy is a reaction to this uh, uh, terrible extension of the human rights concept into the arenas where we cannot agree at home, and that brings you the culture wars. Instead of uh, more understanding and more freedom, it's less freedom is the result. So, uh, no, John O'Sullivan, former speechwriter of, of, uh, of um, Margaret Thatcher, is working in the Danube Institute and is not critical at all. David Harris, the, the other uh, close collaborator, is, is, is working there too. Uh, Georg Habsburg is uh, the great defender of Viktor Orban. So, uh, no, no, that's overestimated and we should be glad that we have uh, Visegrad because in the three major issues, uh, which, has the, which had the geopolitical relevance, uh, we have achieved uh, due to the Visegrad cooperation. It was a NATO enlargement, it was energy security in the north-south uh, dimension, and it was uh, to bring the, the, the reasonable uh, 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 stand into the migration uh, political uh, debate in Europe. So, three very important uh, moments, and uh, we should keep it. And last but not least, EU, as Kari has said, yes, Stalin and, and Hitler were important founding fathers. Uh, I would add uh, the third one, and that's Truman. Don't forget it. It's uh, now getting out of those European textbooks, but the money which the Americans brought by not just the Marshall Plan, uh, the money which prevented uh, the victory of the communist uh, ideas in Western Europe were, uh, were really important and we should, we should remember that because it's about uh, the purpose of the Atlantic cooperation. Thank you. We don't have too much time, so I would hope uh, we can be more concise in the remarks if possible, uh, but I want to make sure all speakers have equal amount of time. So. Uh, Mr. Schwarzenberg, uh, would you like to answer any of these questions? Not all questions, but otherwise I would like to speak too long. Uh, considering the United Nations, yes, we have to accept that the world has changed, that the United Nations is, is a construction which was made uh, 70 years ago and it does not correspond to present needs. Uh, and. Uh, Therefore, it, it's less important than it was. And of course, we got less important too. And when there were roughly half of the member states than today, then Czechoslovakia played a certain role in the United Nations. Now we are only the small Czech Republic. There are numberless other nations. And it's due to its construction, the United Nations for European nations play a lesser role than ever before. We have to accept it, we will stay in the United Nations, we will be active there, but we have to accept the, uh, if the United Nations won't reform themselves, they become more and more obsolete. And then I would like only to touch the Visegrad question. Mm, uh, 
And uh, as we, now too, there was always said, Orban and Kaczynski. They are very different cases. We shouldn't forget that in Poland is very active and living opposition. There is a free press. There are numberless new newspapers who support the opposition. Things which doesn't exist in Hungary. In, and certain, which I would like to mention, and I, having my Hungarian grandmother and loving Hungary too, the difference is that whereas Mr. Kaczynski uh, lives in Warsaw in a small flat with two, two cats, and he even the most uh, vicious enemy of Kaczynski never suspected him that he uh, enriched himself. Look at the development of the wealth of, as of the family of Mr. Orban, as of the surrounding. The regime in Hungary and Poland is very, very different. And it's only the Western press or the European press which equals it. It's a very different countries and very different situations there. Only if we look just as the freedom of the media in both countries, it's an enormous difference. The other questions we would need here yeah, is still one hour to discuss them, so I will limit myself on these two questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And yes, Mr. Pham. I'll try to be quick as well. United Nations, I, I, I agree with the others here. It's still important, less important before, and I think we don't really have good recipes what to do to, to improve it. That's simple. A Dif little bit different story, I think the WTO, where I think that, that there are some possible, possible steps to, towards reform, uh, but I must, I must admit that it's not really an area with, which I would consider myself very well oriented, so I cannot really say much more to it. I, I would maybe try to pick up the, the question about the new European Commission. Uh, I think it's a very interesting question. What, what should the Commission try to achieve uh, on, on the, let's say, geopolitical scale? I think it's not so much about, let's say, military power, even though there are steps to, to increase the, the, the military ability of EU. But I think it's uh, about primarily about, about trying to utilize the economic strength of, of EU and maybe also uh, to improve the, uh, the utilization of uh, diplomatic services working in alignment, working to the, together to achieve common goals. Uh, so this would be the, the tools and what they should be used to. I think the, the climate policy, is, uh, it's clear that a large portion of, of population in, in Europe, including this country, especially young people see this as one of the most serious issues to solve in, in coming or, or improve or, or, or do something about in coming years. And uh, it's, it's absolutely true that if EU does whatever it can alone, uh, it will have little impact. But uh, using the, the economic force to actually lead other partners to, to go along in this, I think uh, it's, it's absolutely necessary if we want to actually achieve something on this front. So maybe I, I would put this on, uh, on the first part of the list. And the second thing is related to security in, in Europe. You know, we, we, we don't know what will happen after one day uh, Vladimir Putin steps down or dies in office or however his, his rule will, will end. But it's clear that after it will end, the situation will not be easy. Uh, and obviously, we, we need to uh, look in a, a longer perspective also on, on, our, on the southern border of uh, EU, which definitely will be a problematic, uh, problematic region for, for years to come. So this would be maybe two of my main wishes for for the next uh, commission. And uh, the Visegrad, uh, <laughs> finally, we do have some disagreement on, uh, in this panel. I, I, I don't think that what's happening, in, uh, especially in Hungary, but also to some extent in Poland, is 
okay in terms of democracy. You know, th there is a clear suppression of, of opposition in Hungary, and that doesn't have much to do with, uh, uh, with uh, real democracy. We had this case of blackmailing judges for their decisions in, uh, against, against the ruling party in, in Poland. You know, I, I think that's, that's a clear problem as well. Uh, uh, the problems uh, with the reform of judiciary systems in Poland, I think, were very well, very well documented. So, and, and actually, Poland pulled, you know, stepped back from some of them. So, um, I'm not saying, uh, I'm not saying uh, this, this is. Uh, you know, full, or these are, or especially Hungary is like, let's say, full-blown authoritative regime, but the, the, the path, I think, is dangerous. And uh, so it, it's very good to, to be on guard here and, and uh, follow the situation closely. Thank you. Thank you. And last remarks from Mr. Lipovsky. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much. On, on UN. Uh, UN, it's necessary organization, it's for defining the global, global consensus. So if the consensus is minimal, then the work of which can, UN can do, it's, it's limited. But uh, I, can th I, I can think on the specific issues, it's, it's very useful. And even Czech Republic can uh, use UN organization for example, for its humanitarian projects and it's doing currently. So um, I think there is no strong way how we could use UN for any specific purpose. We just need to continue in, in the very long term being there. Uh, on, uh, on, the, uh, on, the foreign, on the money which goes to developing countries in relations to developing countries, uh, Czechia has pledged to give uh, the, the one third of one percent of GDP on on uh, on, on this kind of uh, help. Uh, we are not giving uh, this money. We are like on uh, one point uh, uh, one six of GDP or something like that. We should be giving more. Uh, on the other side, the numbers are slowly rising. Uh, and uh, we are having each year basically internal domestic fight how much money should we give because uh, this, this, this foreign help has become the issue of the extremist parties again, you know, the, the Okamura and it's also being mixed up with the fight, fight against NGOs so it's, it's a little bit messy but I hope uh, the budget will continue rising and uh, definitely we need this kind of influence, we need this kind of help to those uh, countries because we should be focused on the solving issues in those countries um, before it comes uh, to us in, in regard to the, the crime, in regard to migration and many other, many other issues. Uh, on commission, I think I would expect from commission that it would increase the defense of uh, Europe. Uh, the, the new defense DG is being created. Uh, we need the European lack of uh, defense uh, being strengthened, and it's not going against NATO. It's a parallel. Uh, it's it's uh, it should be working together because the EU has not uh, reached the state of the political leadership would be able to agree on some common army activities or stuff, uh, something like that. But what we can agree on is let's make find recipes together. Let's make our armies better together. Let's integrate. Uh, uh, let's integrate. Uh, the, the industry, military industry, let's work on the infrastructure because we need uh, units moving across Europe. Let's uh, work on many other issues. So this is what I would expect from uh, the new commissions to do differently and I hope it will be, uh, I, I hope they, they will do it. Uh, regarding for we, uh, how to handle for we? I don't think we need to handle for we much differently than uh, we do now. Uh, my point would be that we need to have a more practical look on war f for we. Uh, uh, it's often said that we, uh, that uh, sometimes said that we look on the war, f war f we for ideologically, 
I think it's a practical institution. So we should define our interest and then try to push to, to explain to Poland, Hungary, Slovak that, you know, let's do it together. Because other, other countries do that. Uh, Poland do that, Hungary do that, and uh, we should be doing that, uh, doing that too. Uh, of course, Hungary has a big problem with democracy and human rights. Uh, Orban is basically trying to, to make money from that state. Uh, he, he, he has very strong policies against NGOs. He ousted the CEU, Central European University. There is no free media, no, no, no free media landscape in that country. And uh, you know, being proud uh, of uh, having strong relations with uh, with such leadership, it's really not, not, not it's really not really not nothing. We should be proud of that. So I am very critical to that, and we should help. You know to. F to Hungarians to have a, as much as free society as, as possible currently. And my, my last point regard, uh, to regard to Poland and Hungary, and I absolutely agree with what Mr. Fansberg has said, those two, uh, two kind of countries are very different and the state of leadership is very different, but you know they are not conservative in many ways because what they are doing currently is a socialistic welfare buying of happiness from the population. It's really not a conservative politic. So that would be my last point. Thank you very much. I would like to thank our uh, speakers and also you for your attention. I think we did not exhaust the topic, so hopefully we'll have another opportunity to dive in and, and discuss. Um, I know I've been blamed for redirecting the topic, but I think speaking about the foreign policy is important and getting those uh, uh, details uh, and then also reflecting on multilateralism at the same time was relevant. So um, I wish everyone um, lots of energy in uh, explaining uh, the layers of the Czech political, uh, uh, I guess, uh, uh, decisions, but also um, how you can influence through your roles um, in positively the, the Czech foreign policy. It would be nice to see more, um, I guess, uh, coverage uh, from the uh, parliamentary diplomacy, which we didn't really touch upon, but we often hear about what the outcomes are from some of the important trips overseas or visitors coming here as well, how that contributes to building ties and, and improving the situation. In any case, um, thanks everyone. This was the final big session in the Great Hall today, end of the symposium in this building, but today we will talk about the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe at the Slovak Institute as a side event of this symposium, which will be the very final event uh, for us today. In any case, big applause, please, and uh, let's hope we'll meet again. <laughs>